The sons of Eärendil were Elros and Elrond, the Perithil, or half-elven. In them alone, the line of the heroic chieftains of the Edain in the First Age was preserved. And after the fall of Gilgalad, the lineage of the High Elven Kings was also in Middle-earth only represented by their descendants. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we are going to take a look at a question that is very fundamental to the faction of the Elves from the end of the Second Age onwards, and that is, why was Gilgalad the last High King of the Elves? Well, I do draw on the lineages and source material, as much as I can in this video, I will say that many of my thoughts here are conjecture on the matter, my best findings from my years of thought about this topic. Please check out our related articles and videos in the description and cards, my friends. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale. To begin, let's look at Gilgalad himself. Ever since the death of Turgon during the fall of Gondolin in 510 of the First Age, Gilgalad was the High King of the Noldor, and, likely with the help of Círdan and others, he was able to survive the battles and wars of the First Age of Middle-earth, and make it on into the Second Age, creating his great elven kingdom with his seat of power in Mithlond, in Linden. Throughout the Second Age, Gilgalad was the High King and ruler of the High Elves, being the son of Orodreth, who was the son of Angrod, the son of Finarfin, who, after the exile of the Noldor, was the king of the Noldor in Valinor, who remained. Now, in the published Silmarillion, Gilgalad was actually the son of Fingon, who was the son of Fingolfin, but this is said to be a mistake by Christopher Tolkien. Regardless of his confounding lineage, the High Kingship did pass down to Gilgalad, but he never married, nor did he have any children or heirs. For me personally, this has always been a strange part of the lore. The fact that one of the most powerful elves, and certainly one of the most important elves of all time, but especially in the Second Age, never married and never produced an heir. While he did assign Elrond to be his vice-regent after the end of the War of the Elves in Sauron and the founding of Rivendell, Gilgalad did not name him as his heir. Now, there are a few ways we can look at this. From a more meta-story and thematic view, Gilgalad being the last High King of the Noldor Elves is really interesting, as it continues this idea of the diminishment of power and nobility throughout the ages. As the Elves got further away from the Elder Days in time and the memory of the Light of Valinor, they too diminished in power and majesty, but they were still far greater in power and majesty than the innocent children of later years, men, dwarves, and hobbits. With Gilgalad's end, the rank of the greatest High Kings of the Elves went with him. As thematically speaking, there was perhaps no character that could truly succeed him. Yet from a different point of view, one that takes more logic and politics into account, as it concerns the succession of power in monarchies, it is very strange that, in the thousands of years that he lived, Gilgalad never married. This could be for an assortment of reasons. Perhaps Gilgalad loved an elf who perished in the War of Wrath, or one who went west. Or perhaps he never fell in love, and never had an heir, like some other elves in the canon. For while marriage is said in the laws and customs of the Eldar in Morgoth's Ring, to be a custom of most elves, some did not marry due to ill fate or strange circumstances. Or maybe there was some other reason that this never occurred then. It could be that, since elves are immortal, Gilgalad thought it unnecessary to have an heir, as he would likely be around forever to rule his people, but as we know through the bloody history of the First Age, a history that he knew well, I feel that would be quite the unwise oversight on behalf of an elven king who lived in the Second Age, to actually think something like that. Either way, while this makes sense thematically, it is admittedly strange that Gilgalad, even over thousands of years, never had a designated heir, and with his death at the literal hand of Sauron, there was no one left to rule the Noldor at large. Mayhaps the Noldor were so diminished in Middle-earth by the late Second Age already, that they didn't really need a ruler, as their destiny lay either in death, their fading in Middle-earth, or in the West. Maybe there was no kingdom left for a king to even rule. But even with all of this, there are at least two elves that theoretically had a claim to the High Kingship or Queenship of the Noldor, if such laws and customs amongst the elves were changed to allow this. Elrond, the heir of High King Turgon, or Galadriel, the daughter of Finarfin, and the great aunt of High King Gilgalad himself, both had a claim to the throne. Now it seems to be that these two did not take the position for a few reasons. Even though the Numenorians, at a point in their history, gave up the practice of agnatic primogeniture, the idea that only sons, eldest to youngest, could take up royal titles and instead eventually allowed women to rule, it seems that the Noldor actually held to this tradition within their royalty. 
In fact, I would argue that if male and female elves could inherit the High Throne, Gilgalad would not have ever even probably become the High King, for the throne would likely have passed to Idril, daughter of Torgon after his death, and then to Eärendil when she sailed away, and then to Elrond when Eärendil became a star in the sky, and when Elros' brother became the first king of the Numenorians. And then Elrond and Elros would have been the High King of the Noldor and that first king of the Numenorians, respectively. And then, after Elrond, the throne would have passed to Eladon or Elro here if something ever happened to him, and then to Arwen. But if something happened to all of them, then likely the succession would have been passed back up the family tree to Torgon's cousin, Galadriel. Again, if female and male elves could both be heirs to the throne, it is likely that Gilgalad would actually never have even become the High King at all. Unless Gilgalad was the son of Fingon. But then Torgon would never have become High King like he was in the canon. For that reason, in terms of the logical line of succession, the line of High Kings was broken with Gilgalad's death because this rule was in place. But why did the elves not change these laws and customs, especially after the end of Gilgalad, their last High King? Why wasn't Elrond, the vice-regent of Gilgalad, heir to the former High King Torgon, and the heir of Fingolfin himself, not made the new High King at the end of the Second Age? I think it was partially out of respect, both for the traditions of the High Kingship of old, and for the realms of the Noldor in the later ages of the world. And I think it was also respect especially to Gilgalad himself. I think our elven characters were aware of that theme of diminishment of the Noldor too. And with the death of Gilgalad, some things were lost that could never be regained. And one of them was the valor that came with the High Kingship. Elrond was the Lord of Imladris, and that was enough. Galadriel was the Lady of Lorien, and that was enough for her, though perhaps at one point in time she wanted to be the queen of an even greater realm. The elves had never changed the tradition of agnatic primogeniture, nor would they in the future. Perhaps the elven desire to not change tradition actually speaks to their culture. Because they were immortal, they lived to remember their traditions and how they were as of old, and wished to keep as close to the old ways as possible. The central governing system of the elves broke with Gilgalad's death, and the elves likely decided that simply ruling their own realms while they lasted in Middle-earth and working together as allies, especially in the White Council, would be best. But I am curious to hear what you all think as well. And so we come to the end of our tale. From this story we see that even things that seem as though they will last forever do not, and we should enjoy those things and people that we know in the time that we have them. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. Let me know your thoughts on this matter. Do you believe that we found the answer to the question of Gilgalad being the last High King today? Or are there other facts that you would like to add to this conversation? Let me know in the comments below. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider getting some candles from our friends Mythology Candles, or order some Weta or United Cutlery Lord of the Rings swords, statues, and other replicas from Castle Khan, who does international shipping, and use the code WEST at checkout, and please check out our merch and Patreon. Thanks to our Valor Tier patrons and YouTube members, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Mark Krylik, Molly Sullivan, Blair Scout and Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Matt Sabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolik, Anthony Harmon, Dorwin Gray, Arthur Merlin, Dale Davis, Kingswald Project, and Robert Bogue and King of Games 2500, our newest Valor tier YouTube member. Thank you so much to all of our patrons and YouTube members. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next Sunday with a video bringing back my old Who Would Win series, talking about Durin's Bane versus Smaug. You all are the best, my friends. Thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.